folks, I think we're going to uh, go ahead and, and get ready to get started. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight to Longfellow House Washington's headquarters, National Historic Site. Uh, my name's Garrett. I don't know you, and I, I do see quite a few new faces, so welcome if this is your first time on the site. And of course, welcome if you're here every week during the summer, too. Um, so we have a couple of our volunteers over here. So. Um, uh, but thank you all for coming, and this is always a great night um, when we get together every year to commemorate Boston's Evacuation Day on March 17th, 1776, and I do know it's not March 17th, but I haven't been able to figure out how to make March 17th fall on a Thursday every year. <laughs> so we do as, 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 get as close as we can. But um, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome once again um, John Bell. Um, a lot of you know John from Boston 1775, from lectures all over, from Road to Concord, his uh, Concord, sorry, Road to Concord, <laughs> what am I thinking? Um, so I'm tired, but Road to Concord, um, published 16, 2016, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. Um, and uh, you might not know that he is also the author of about 600 pages on George Washington's slightly less than nine months in, in this house. And you can download that from our website if you're interested in checking that out. Um, yeah, if you would, uh, please join me in welcoming John to the site. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you to the National Park Service for uh, supporting this, uh, the research that is behind this talk and for having me here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is part of a series of events that is taking place uh, around different historic sites uh, in Boston and on the South Shore uh, called Remember Abigail, which uh, is focused on Abigail Adams and her long life and her many contributions to uh, Massachusetts and American politics. Uh, these are the portraits of George Washington and John Adams as we usually think of them from the 1790s, when they were the president and vice first president and first vice president of the United States. And we often think of them as senior statesmen. But this is going to be a talk about them when they first met about 20 years earlier, when Washington was just 42 years old and John Adams was just turning 40, and how their work intersected, especially with events here in and around Washington's headquarters. This is what Washington looked like in 1774 on the left, as painted by Charles Wilson Peel. He was dressed in his Vir Virginia militia uniform, and Peel made a, might have painted him to look younger, as he did when he was wearing that uniform full time. Uh, on the right is Washington, just a couple of years later, also by Charles Wilson Peel, as general of the Continental Army. And here are the earliest portraits we have of John and Abigail Adams uh, by an artist named Benjamin Blythe who worked in pastels. And Abigail uh, was nine years younger than her husband, so she was in her early 30s in the time that I'm talking about. In 1774, John Adams was one of Massachusetts's rising young lawyers, rising patriot lawyers, and he moved back and forth uh, over the previous several years between Braintree, the town where he was born, and Boston. Uh, he had served in elective office in both towns. He also rode circuit to different county seats all over Massachusetts, which took him through New Hampshire because Maine was still part of Massachusetts. He went down to Connecticut for uh, the waters at one point. Uh, but he had never been outside New England. In contrast, George Washington's travels had taken him all the way west to what is now Pittsburgh. He had he spent a summer in Barbados. He was um, had a much more expansive view of uh, British North America. He had even come to Boston as a young man to meet with Governor William Shirley. This is the governor's mansion in Roxbury. Uh, and at that time, uh, John Adams was out in Worcester teaching school, trying to decide what career he would choose. He very quickly decided he would not choose a career as a school teacher. Uh, that, so they didn't intersect at that time. Now, on the other hand, I talked about Washington as a more worldly, more experienced man. He never had the college education that Adams had. He did not have Adams' deep uh, understanding, deep reading in multiple languages about law and government. So they were both elite colonial gentlemen, but they were of very different kinds. And the two of them first met in September 1774 in Philadelphia. Delegates from 12 colonies up and down the 
uh, North American coast from New Hampshire uh, to South Carolina met in Carpenter's Hall, which is a new building uh, in the colony's largest city of Philadelphia. Massachusetts had sent to this first Continental Congress the Speaker of the House, Thomas Cushing, the Clerk of the House, Samuel Adams, and the two politically active country lawyers, Robert Treat Payne and John Adams. They were to represent the colony. Virginia, the largest and oldest colony among the British uh, provinces, in both population and land the largest, then it had sent seven men. And in Inventing America, a very good book by Gary Wills, he spent his first chapter describing how these big, rich planters came riding into town with their retinue of enslaved servants behind them. The men, they were thought of as the orators. They were, at least three of them were over six feet tall in a, ta uh, a time when not many men were. Uh, coming in uh, almost as royalty, almost as like the Magi into Philadelphia. The leader was Peyton Randolph, the Speaker of the House of Burgesses, there's Richard Henry Lee, there's Benjamin Harrison. Uh, uh, immediately Peyton Randolph would be elected the President of the Congress. And the day after those, the first four arrived, the next three arrived, Patrick Henry, Edmund Pendleton, and George Washington. Now, Washington was an experienced legislator. He had, had been in the House of Burgesses for a number of years, but he was not a legislative leader like most of the other men. Uh, he had been, what he had as experience was being colonel of the Virginia Regiment during the uh, two and a half years of the last war against the French. Uh, so that gave him as much experience in military administration as basically anybody else born in America. Uh, already men in Philadelphia were talking about Colonel Washington. And in fact, on August 31st, John Adams wrote in his diary about a rumor that Colonel Washington made the most eloquent speech at the, at the Virginia Convention that was ever made. He says he, I will raise a thousand men, subsist them at my own expense, and march myself at their head for the relief of Boston. Very impressive. Totally false. <laughs> During that first Continental Congress, George Washington didn't serve on any committee. The records don't show him speaking on any issue, which should you know, give doubts that he had uh, delivered the most eloquent speech that was ever made in Virginia. <laughs> Nevertheless, Washington was among the more militant Whigs or patriots uh, at, that, uh, at that gathering. In, in fact, back in 1769, Washington had written to his neighbor, George Mason, that no man should scruple or hesitate to use arms, and he left out the R in arms in the clever way of, of disguising what he is saying, but arms in defense of the liberty which we have derived from our ancestors, yet arms, I would beg leave to add, should be a last resource. So he was actually talking about using, uh, about armed rebellion against the crown, against the government in London, if it continued to encroach on American liberties, back in 1769, and that is one of the earliest uh, moments at which somebody speaks favorably of armed rebellion. <coughs> And another of the most militant delegates at that Congress was John Adams. So they uh, connected. On October 17th at Thomas Mifflin's house, Mifflin is the larger man here, Benjamin Rush up at the top recalled Adams saying he had no expectation of a redress of grievances and a reconciliation of the Great Britain. And as proof of this belief, he gave as a toast, cash and gunpowder to the Yankees. <laughs> and we know Washington was there, he put it in his diary, we don't know what his reaction to that remark was, but it is interesting to see these two men already socializing, already in the same circle, the same faction of the First Continental Congress. That Congress broke up on October 26, 1774. John Adams went home to his farmhouse and his wife Abigail in Braintree. And at this point, he was sort of left out of the political organizing because he was not part of the Patriot government in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, or its committees. Uh, and so he, but he did spend the winter uh, writing what became known as the Novanglas newspaper essays. Meanwhile, George Washington returned to Mount Vernon. Now, it was not quite this big yet. This was the year, 1774, when he started to plan the, the uh, expansion on either side. So it looked, it was, it was narrow. <laughs> but nevertheless, it was huge compared to that little farmhouse in 
brain tree. And the lands and the slaves that he had, the Adamses never owned slaves. He was just on a different scale from uh, the Adams. Uh, Adams's farm. Of course, Adams also had his uh, law practice as his main uh, income. During the Congress, Virginia gentlemen had been meeting in county conventions, and many of those conventions had called on, called to form independent militia companies, militia companies that didn't uh, answer to the royal governor, but took their authority from these men coming together. And five of those co county companies called on George Washington, Colonel Washington from the last war, to lead them. Uh, in Philadelphia, he had bought a sword chain, sash, gorget, and epaulets, the insignia uh, of a military officer. And the uh, companies wrote to him in Philadelphia and asked about uniforms, and he recommended coats of buff and blue. Uh, blue coats with buff or um, undyed uh, lapels and cuffs. Those were called the facings. Buff and blue were the colors of the Whigs a century earlier in Britain. And this is what the uniform that George Washington recommended looked like. Washington prepared for military command in those months from late 1774 to early 1775. He met at Mount Vernon with military experts like the former British Army officers Charles Lee and Horatio Gates. He drilled his local county militia. Everybody knew that there would be a new Continental Congress in May. Both Washington and Adams were re-elected as delegates from their colonies, and they came having had different experiences since the last first, since the first Continental Congress. Adams had been writing about politics. George Washington had been preparing military units. And, uh, to, and as they were uh, still waiting for this Congress to open, on April 19, 1775, war broke out in Lexington and Concord. John Adams rode through the aftermath of this battle on his way to Philadelphia, seeing militia units mobilizing and marching to the front, uh, seeing refugees who had come out of Boston. The news reached Mount Vernon on uh, April 26th, and five days later, Washington wrote to an old friend who had moved to Britain, unhappy it is, though, to reflect that a brother's sword has been sheathed in a brother's breast. Washington told his wife, Martha, that he might be away for several months. <laughs> he even planned his will, and he rode off to the Congress with other delegates, and on the way he reviewed more militia in Baltimore. He's still working on the military side. The Second Continental Congress met in the Pennsylvania State House, which is now Independence Hall. In a letter to Abigail, John Adams mentioned something else new about this Congress. Colonel Washington appears at Congress in his uniform. <laughs> and by his great experience and abilities in military matters, he is of much service to us. Oh, that I was a soldier. I will be. I am reading military books. <laughs> Everybody must and will be and shall be a soldier. <laughs> the Massachusetts delegation also included a new delegate, John Hancock, who was acclaimed for, uh, there's, there's Washington in the uniform. John Hancock, who was acclaimed for uh, supposedly escaping from the Redcoats in Lexington with Samuel Adams, who really set the delegation strategy. All the New England colonies, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, were now at war with the Royal Army outside Boston. The New England leaders wanted the rest of the colonies to join them, to support them, not less just with formal protests or diplomacy, but with money and with men. And they knew that gaining that support would mean giving up some control. On May 11th, John Hancock asked the Congress to support Massachusetts' rebel government. Uh, and to consider that proposal, the, committee, the Congress immediately made itself the Committee of the Whole, which meant that they could close their doors and uh, uh, meet in secret, limited note-taking. And during these discussions, Washington became more prominent. He had been on, as I said before, no committees of the First Continental Congress. This time, every time they came up with a committee on military matters, they put him on it and they put him in charge. <laughs> so, fortifying posts in what is upstate New York, Washington. Gathering ammunition and other military stores, Washington. Taking the regulation and general direction of the army around Boston, i.e. taking control of that army. Borrowing 6,000 pounds for gunpowder for use of the Continental Army. There was no Continental Army legally yet, but they were already thinking about, okay, how, what are we going to spend on this? How are we going to keep the support? 
On June 10th, John Adams wrote home to Abigail, In Congress we are bound to secrecy. But under the rose, I believe that 10,000 men will be maintained in Massachusetts and 5,000 in New York on the continental expense. So the Congress was actually going to spend money on this. On June 14th, the Congress put Washington in charge of a committee to bring in a, dra a draft of rules and regulations for the government of the Army. And one of the Virginia delegates wrote home that day, Colonel Washington has been pressed to take the supreme command of the American troops encamped at Roxbury and I believe will accept the appointment, though with much reluctance, he being diffident about his own superior <laughs> There is no formal record of the debate leading up to that decision. Decades later, John Adams wrote some very long accounts of the moment, and there were two main points to the story he told. First, he, John Adams, had proposed making Washington commander-in-chief. And second, Many people were stubbornly, or unreasonably opposed to his wise proposal. <laughs> there is no evidence to confirm Adams' memory, and some pretty solid evidence against it. <laughs> I'm going to tell Adams' version of events, and, which has become famous, so it's almost, in many uh, books and many histories, it's the standard story. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, why I don't believe it. According to Adams, I walked, with, I walked with Mr. Staniel Adams in the State House yard for a little exercise in fresh air before the hour of Congress, and there represented to him the various dangers that surrounded us. I said, what, he said, what shall we do? I answered him, I am determined this morning to make a direct motion that Congress should adopt the army before Boston and appoint Colonel Washington commander of it. Mr. Adams seemed to think seriously of it, but said nothing. Accordingly, when Congress was, had assembled, I rose in my place, and in as short a speech as the subject would admit, represented the state of the colonies. I concluded with a motion to re inform the Congress that would adopt the army at Cambridge and appoint a general. I had no hesitation to declare that I had but one gentleman in mind for that important assignment, and that was a gentleman from Virginia who was among us. Mr. Washington, who happened to sit near the door, as soon as he heard me allude to him from his usual modesty, darted into the library room. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hancock, while I was speaking on the state of the army at Cambridge and the enemy, heard me with visible pleasure. But when I came to describe Washington for the cute commander, I never remarked a more sudden and sinking change of countenance. <laughs> Mortification and resentment were expressed as forcibly as his face could exhibit them. Mr. Samuel Adams seconded the motion, and that did not soften the president's physiognomy at all. <laughs> the subject came under debate, and several gentlemen declared themselves against the appointment of Mr. Washington, not on account of any personal objection <coughs> against him, but because the army was all from New England. Mr. Pendleton of Virginia and Mr. Sherman of Connecticut were very explicit in declaring this opposition. Mr. Cushing and several others more faintly expressed their opposition and their fears of discontent in the army and in New England. The subject was postponed to a future day. And Adams wrote an even longer version of that story in 1815. Adams <coughs> insisted that the choice of Washington was an instance of apparent unanimity and real regret in nearly half the delegates. But there's a pattern in Adams' memories, written late in life, which had placed himself at the center stage and portrayed the opposition to his ideas as much stronger than other contemporaneous sources suggest. Evidence from 1775 tells a different story. First, there's no evidence to confirm that Hancock wanted to be Continental General. Uh, this would have gone against the New Englanders' whole political strategy of bringing in the other, uh, the other colonies. The family of Thomas Johnson of Maryland insisted that he nominated Washington, and in some versions of the story, Adams acknowledged that. In some, he didn't. <laughs> uh, third, there's no sign of dissent in Congress about choosing Washington. And in fact, Adams' own writings bear that out. On June 17th, he wrote, told Abigail that naming the Virginian was cementing and securing the union of these colonies. It was a sign of unity, not of real regret by anyone. I don't doubt that, Washington, that Adams had to argue hard for appointing a general, and for having the Congress take over the army, and for other things throughout the, Con the Continental Congress. I just don't think he had to argue hard for Washington's appointment against strong opposition. I'm convinced by the argument in Paul Longmore's book, The Invention of George Washington, uh, that the conflict Adams remembered 
decades later, was the argument in the Congress over hiring General Charles Lee as a subordinate general. Should he be Washington's second in command, or as it turned out, his third in command? Should he be hired at all, given that he wasn't from America, he was a, a disappointed British officer? Adams, in fact, told Elbert Jerry in 1775 about choosing the generals below Washington, I have never in all my lifetime suffered more anxiety than in the conduct of this business. So that's where he really ran into opposition. Officially, on June 15th, the Congress voted a general be appointed to command all the Continental forces, and $500 per month be allowed for his pay and expenses. And by ballot, George Washington Esquire was unanimously elected. Washington declined the salary, asking only for reimbursement of his expenses, which made a deep uh, impression on his fellow delegates. Uh, still, they were going to be very generous with expenses. They expected him to live in genteel style in a house like this, uh, with servants, with uh, uh, fine food and uh, everything, um, as a gentleman should. <laughs> the Congress then chose a committee to draft a commission and instructions for the new general. Uh, they put on that committee Richard Henry Lee, who was a close friend of Washington from Virginia, John Adams, who was one of the people who was most enthusiastic about prosecuting the war, and Edward Rutledge, a delegate from South Carolina who was one of the most reluctant about the war. So that they had the full spectrum of opinions in Congress represented on this committee. The new generals uh, prepared to depart for Boston, and the New England delegates got busy sending the news to their colleagues at home and talking up how what, what a wonderful idea this was, how this was good news, everybody should be happy. Uh, Silas Dean, uh, they also especially emphasized Washington's personal qualities. So Silas Dean of Connecticut wrote, the more I am acquainted with him, the more I esteem him. And Elizabeth Dyer of uh, Connecticut also wrote, discreet and virtuous, no a harem of scarum, ranting, swearing fellow, but sober, steady, and calm. And Thomas Cushing from Massachusetts said, he's a complete gentleman. He's sensible, amiable, virtuous, and modest, and brave. <laughs> Among those praising the new General Washington was John Adams. The Congress have made a choice of a virtuous and modest, the amiable, generous, and brave George Washington Esquire to be the General of the American Army. I hope the people of our province will treat the General with all that confidence and affection, with that politeness and respect, which is due to one of the most important characters of the world. So they were really laying it on thick to make sure that there was no objection from the New Englanders that they sent a Virginian to be in charge. <coughs> on June 18th, John also wrote to Abigail, This letter, I presume, will go by the brave and amiable General Washington. This uh, Congress are all as deep as the delegates from Massachusetts, and the whole continent as forward as Boston. So again, they had achieved uh, their goal, the New Englanders, of unifying the colonies behind uh, the cause of Massachusetts. Washington asked Adams to describe the political situation in Massachusetts. He bought military supplies and books. He sent <coughs> Horatio Gates, one of those British officers uh, who he wanted to be his uh, adjutant general. And, but it took a while for all this to happen until Washington and his staff finally left Philadelphia on the morning of June 23rd. And Adams was there to describe his, their departure. The three generals were all mounted on horseback and accompanied by Major Mifflin, who was gone in the character of aide de camp. All the delegates from Massachusetts, with their servants and carriages, attended. Many others of the delegates from the Congress, a large troop of light horse in their uniforms, many officers of militia besides and theirs, music playing, etc., etc., such is the pride and pomp of war. So you can see that he was, you know, once again, feeling a little jealous of somebody else giving all his attention because he wasn't a soldier. Washington and General Charles Lee arrived in Cambridge on the afternoon of June 2nd, 1775, and they took quarters in this house, the Wadsworth House, now part of Harvard Yard. And their first job was riding all around the siege lines, looking for weak spots. They found a lot of weak spots. <laughs> During those early days, Washington met Abigail Adams, and Abigail wrote to John on July 16th. The appointment of the generals Washington and Lee gives universal satisfaction. The people have the highest opinion of Lee's abilities. I had the pleasure of seeing both the generals and their aide de camp soon after their arrival, and of being personally made known to them. They very politely expressed their regard for you. I was struck with General Washington. You had prepared me to entertain a favorable opinion of him. 
But I had thought that one half was not told me. Dignity with ease and complacency. The gentleman and the soldier look agreeably blended in him. Modesty marks every line and feature of his face. Those lines of Dryden instantly occurred to me. Mark his majestic fabric. He's a temple sacred by birth. It built by hands divine. His soul's the deity that lodges there. Nor is the file unworthy of the god. <laughs> she was impressed. <laughs> Abigail wasn't so positive about General Lee, who said, General Lee looks like a careless, hardy veteran, and from his appearance brought to, to my mind his namesake Charles II, King of Sweden, the elegance of his pen far exceeds that of his person. <laughs> Uh, Martha, uh, Abigail also had uh, interesting comments about Thomas Mifflin, who was soon, he came as the aide de camp, he was soon quartermaster general in charge of supplying the army, and he moved into this house, which is just down the street here, maintained uh, by the daughter of a, the former loyalist owner who had fled away. Uh, it is now part of the Cambridge Center for Adult Education, um, the Brattle House. The lady of the house, the daughter of the former owner, uh, had kept stayed in there and she also kept her teenage daughter and a friend there. So it was the only house around with young women in it. And so it was very popular with the Continental Army officers. <laughs> in August, Abigail visited and she wrote to John in Philadelphia about Mif Thomas Mifflin's wife, Sarah. Tell her I do not know whether her husband is safe here. <laughs> Bologna and Cupid have a contest about. You hear nothing from the ladies but how about Major Mifflin's easy address, politeness, complacence, etc., etc. Mrs. Mifflin set out for Cambridge that month. <laughs> uh, Washington's first letter back to the Congress on July 10th shared some bad news. He complained about the quality of the troops. He complained about the quality, especially of the military engineers and the fortifications and the artillery around Boston. <laughs> and the Massachusetts delegates in Philadelphia, including Adams, were astonished by that news because they thought, especially the head of the artillery, was a veteran of the last two wars. He had a regular commission from the British Army. They thought that he was uh, an artillery genius. The Virginia delegate, Benjamin Harrison, warned of Washington. Some folks here seem much displeased that you were report on that. <laughs> and John Adams, in fact, took the opportunity to write home to his protege, John William Tudor, clearly concerned. I beg you would let me know what has become of Colonel Ridley and Mr. Burbank. I had heard the generals were much disappointed in not finding these engineers. And eventually his friend, James Warren, confirmed Washington's assessment. For the rest of 1775, Adams kept up that pattern. He would write to friends that he knew in Massachusetts for information about the army. Sometimes he wrote to politicians like James Warren, sometimes he wrote to the Massachusetts generals. He was asking them for private advice outside the regular channels, going around Washington. Uh, for instance, he asked about black men serving in the army. In October, Washington opposed the idea of re-enlisting those soldiers, and delegates from the uh, the colonies with large enslaved populations were grumbling about having black soldiers, but General John Thomas of Massachusetts told Adams that those soldiers were just as good as the whites. At that point, Washington eventually changed his mind, but this is an example of Adams trying to find out information any way he could. He was one of the strongest voices in the Congress for the Army and the Navy, but he felt that he didn't have all the knowledge he needed for that job, uh, either military affairs or of the situation on the ground. So he was also still feeling out this new General Washington. And he did this by you know, learning, by reading, by writing letters, by asking questions. He did not feel that he had all the answers. In mid-August 1775, the entire delegation of the, to the Congress, including John Adams, came here to Washington's headquarters. This is how it more of how it looked that it wasn't yellow until decades later. Uh, they, the delegates came at that point to deliver continental money, printed uh, currency, to Washington in order to go to the paymaster in order to pay all the soldiers. And that visit appears to be brief without pressing business. Uh, but uh, they would have had some conversations about how the war was going and how, in fact, it wasn't going very far at all at that point. 
In late summer of 1775, Washington and Adams shared an embarrassing experience together. Uh, it started in late July with a young Boston lawyer named Benjamin Hitchborn. We don't have a picture of him, so I'm showing a picture of the family house in the North End, which is right beside the Paul Revere house, which you can see behind. And the Hitchborn house, it's bigger, it's brick, it was the more luxurious house uh, compared to this uh, small wooden house where the Revere's lived. Hitchborn was a young uh, man who had clerked for a loyalist lawyer, and he wanted to show that he would side, he sided with the Patriots. So he went to Philadelphia, and he cajoled two delegates into trusting him to carry letters back to Massachusetts. Adams sent a letter to Abigail and another to his friend James Warren of Plymouth. Benjamin Harrison of Virginia sent a letter to his friend General Washington. Now, at this time, the American governments controlled all the roads, while the Royal Navy ruled the sea. It, therefore, would make sense to travel by land. Hitchborn decided to cross Long Island Sound on a ship, and the Royal Navy stopped the vessel. Hitchborn, you might have thought that if he was so important, it was so important to be carrying these letters, he would keep them secret. No, he had boasted to people on the ship about how he had these letters, uh, and another passenger told the Navy captain. Hitchborn had planned these elaborate ways to destroy the letters or hide the letters, and he never did anything. Of the and so the letters were seized by the Royal Navy and taken into Boston, as was Hitchborn in chain. On August 17th, the British published the letters in the Boston newsletter. Someone had inserted a paragraph into Harrison's letter to Washington, which said, in Harrison's voice, as I was in the pleasure and pleasing task of writing to you, a little noise occasioned me to turn my head around, and who should appear but pretty little Kate, the washerwoman's daughter, over the way, clean, trim, and rosy as the morning. I snatched the golden, glorious opportunity, and but for that proof's cursed antidote to love Suki, I had fitted her for my general against his return. We were obliged to part, but not till we had contrived to meet again. If she keeps the appointment, I shall relish a week's longer stay. I give you now and then some of these adventures to amuse you and unbend your mind from the cares of war. <laughs> now, obviously, that passage about having sex with the, the washerwoman's daughter and saving her for General Washington was supposed to embarrass the general. As for John Adams's two letters, the royal officials didn't alter those at all. They just published Adams's usual unvarnished opinions, <laughs> knowing that that would cause enough division among the patriots. <laughs> to Abigail, John had complained about the fidgets, the whims, the caprice, the vanity, the superstition, the irritability of some of us in the Congress. In a letter to, the letter to Warren, Adams wrote about a certain great fortune and piddling genius whose fame has, fame has been trumpeted so loudly that everyone knew that that was John Dickinson of Pennsylvania. And he closed the letter to Warren with an obvious allusion to General Charles Lee. You observe in your letter the oddity of a great man. He is a queer creature, but you must love his dogs if you love him. For you have a thousand whims for the sake of the soldier and the scholar. This eventually caused Abigail to have to mend fences with General Lee. Uh, she made a visit to Cambridge in early December. John had asked her to call on Mary Morgan, the wife of the new Surgeon General, and Abigail met the Morgans at Thomas Mifflin's house, uh, Rattle House. Washington wasn't there, but General Gates was there, and General Lee was there. And Abigail reported back to John, I was very politely entertained and noticed by the generals, more especially General Lee, who was very urgent with me to tarry in town and dine with him at the, and the ladies present at Hobgoblin Hall which is what he called his, uh, the house he was using in Medford, now the Royal House. But I excused myself. The general was determined that I should not only be acquainted with him, but with his companion also, and therefore placed a chair before me in which he ordered Mr. Sparger to mount and present his paw to me for a better acquaintance. <laughs> I could not do otherwise than accept it. That, madam, says he, is the dog which Mr. Adams has rendered famous. <laughs> so, Abigail made up with General Lee and General Lee's dog. <laughs> Martha Washington arrived in Cambridge the very next day, but unfortunately that means that Abigail Adams had gone home to Braintree and they didn't meet. 
I don't think they met until uh, they were both in New York in 1789 at the beginning of the Washington administration. John Adams came home to, for the winter of 1775-76. He visited Watertown where the Massachusetts government was meeting and George Washington reached out to him. On January 7th, Washington wrote, if it could be made convenient and agreeable for you to take a pot luck with me today, I shall be very glad of your company, and we can talk over the matter at large. Now that invitation sounds very casual, potluck, uh, sort of soldier's dinner in the house, but it wasn't really casual. Washington had received warnings from his former military secretary, Joseph Reed, that some Massachusetts politicians were feeling neglected, officially or socially, uh, and on January 14th, the general wrote back a little piece. They could not surely conceive that there was a propriety in unbosoming the secrets of the army to them, that it was necessary to ask their opinion of throwing up an entrenchment, forming a battalion, etc., etc. But he set out to improve relations with local political leaders. And so he had John Adams over for Papa. The day after writing that letter, Adams, uh, Washington heard that Adams was still nearby, dining with two Massachusetts legislators. So the general postponed a council of war and invited those men to come and sit in. During that time, Washington raised the topic of an attack on Boston and how he needed more troops. And the council agreed unanimously that a vigorous attempt ought to be made upon the ministerial army in Boston as soon as practical. So this was a way of mending fences, of uh, putting, bringing everyone together behind this aggressive plan. And Adams was being aggressive, Washington was being aggressive. Uh, they were seeing, they were coming together, they were having a meeting of minds. John Adams was here in Cambridge again on January 24th. This time Washington drew him into an effort to entertain visitors from Cognawaga <coughs> near Montreal. That was a community of Mohawk <coughs> Indians who at the time were leaning towards supporting the Bostons against the British. Uh, one of those men was this man uh, drawn by John Trumbull, who was a, an aide de camp in the house for 19 days. Uh, this is a man named Colonel Lewis, uh, who was actually of both native uh, Abenaki and African descent, uh, and uh, later became, got a um, commission as lieutenant colonel. So he was the highest ranking officer of color on either side during the war. Adams described the dinner with Colonel Lewis and the Cognawaga Mohawks in, a in detail to a letter in, in a letter to Abigail. I dined at Colonel Mifflin with the general and lady and vast collection of other company, among whom were six or seven sachems and warriors of the French Cognawaga Indians, with several of their wives and children. A savage feast they made of it, but very polite in the Indian style. I was introduced to them by the general as one of the grand council fire at Philadelphia which made them prick up their ears. They came and shook hands with me and made me low bows and scrapes, etc. In short, I was much pleased with the day's entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the period when Adams and Washington seems to have bonded. January 1776, through those three visits, through personal uh, interactions, through discussing the siege, the uh, uh, attempt on Canada, which is what the uh, natives were there for, Washington recognized Adams as an ally on the political <coughs> side. Adams came to respect Washington's approach to the war. Adams went back to Philadelphia and kept pushing for more forceful action. Washington stayed at work in Cambridge, trying to mount an attack on the British in Boston, as well as coordinating army operations in Canada, ships on the ocean, all sorts of things. In February 1776, he presented his council of war and his other generals with yet another plan to attack Boston. And the generals, yet again, rejected it. They endorsed instead General Artemis Ward's plan to fortify Dorchester Heights, which are the hills here. And they would, uh, from there, if you had cannon, you could uh, hit ships in the harbor and uh, threaten the uh, British supply and naval uh, forces. Washington threw himself into carrying out that plan, even though he wasn't originally enthusiastic about it. And in early March, that operation was successful. On Sunday, March 17th, Abigail Adams wrote to her husband, the firing from Dorchester Heights, obliged our enemy to decamp this morning on board the transports. 
as I hear by a messenger just come from headquarters. Our people, I hear, will have the liberty to enter Boston, those who have had the smallpox. From Penn's Hill, we have a view of the largest fleet ever seen in America. You may count upwards of 100 or 70 sail. They look like a forest. Our general may say, with Caesar, Benny Didi at Vicky. We came, we saw, and we conquered. <laughs> general Washington had achieved his first military victory, March 17, 1776, and he had also over the previous months, laid the foundation of a lifelong working relationship with John and Abigail Adams. Thank you very much. Oh. And I'm happy to entertain questions about what I talked about here or other uh, uh, thoughts about Washington, Adams, the siege, the house in the revolutionary period, and so on. What was the last house? The last house is what's called the Adams Bush Place. Uh, that is the, the farmhouse. Uh, that's the farmhouse where John Adams was born. Uh, and I believe I've heard it before that uh, we have a descendant of the family that sold that real estate to they the Adams family. The land and the house. The land and the house. The, uh, Adams' father was a, a selectman, a farmer. He also made shoes. He was a a uh, pretty big man in a pretty small pond of brain tree. And uh, uh, this house was what Adams inherited. During the war, Abigail uh, made some very good investments in American bombs and uh, other things, goods that she was able to have uh, brought from one part of America to another. So she really built up the family fortune. And in the late 1780s, when they came back into uh, America after John's diplomatic career, they were able to move into yes. the big house in the neighborhood, which is what we now think of as the house yes. of the president, called Peacefield. Um, interestingly, that house was built by uh, a man named Leonard Vassell, who was, I believe, grandfather of the man who built this house. So there was a connection there. Uh, the Vassells were one of the, the wealthy uh, planter families in Massachusetts, so there, are, there were other Vassell families, other Vassell houses that they would have known around. Another okay. house question. Mm -hmm. You said that General Lee was staying at the Royal House, which is uh, outside Memphis Square. <coughs> but they were loyalists. Were the loyalists already chased out? Yep. Um, this all happened in September 1774, for the most part. Um, there was something called the Powder Alarm, which was a uh, the British general in charge of, of Austin General, Thomas Gage, ordered men to go out to the powder house on top of a hill in Somerville. Uh, it's, a, it's a cylindrical stone building. And take away all the powder. And as the rumors of that event took, uh, went, uh, traveled south, they became more and more dire. And people were talking about a new Boston massacre, and then they were talking about the Royal Navy shelling Boston. And so it was a militia uprising, just as there was later during Lexington and at other times when there was a People thought there was a military emergency, and 5,000 armed men converged on Cambridge. By that time, they discovered that there was no uh, real military emergency, but they decided that they would force all the royal appointees in Cambridge to resign. So they uh, went to uh, Judge Lee, who lived in what is now the Cambridge Historical Society, uh, and uh, insisted he resigned from the council. They went to Thomas Oliver, the lieutenant governor, who lived in Elmwood, which is now the Harvard President's house, and insisted he resigned from the council. Um, John Vassell, who lived in this house, was not politically active, but he had told uh, General Gage just a short time before that he was willing to be on the council also, which is just the wrong timing to, <laughs> to say that. Uh, so all these families got out. Isaac Royal, interestingly, did not get out. He was not very politically active. He was not, uh, he had a deeper relationship with his neighbors. But in April 1775, he decided it was too hot and went into Boston. So all these big houses, uh, the Ryle House, the Basil House, uh, the Oliver House, the Loring Greenow House in Jamaica Plain, the Shirley Eustace House, uh, which I showed earlier, uh, these big mansions were empty because the Loyalists were behind the British Army lines in Boston where it was safe, and where many of them actually had houses 
uh, for the winter anyway. Um, so when the war began, the Continental Army, or the first the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, then the Continental Army, basically took over all those big buildings and turned them into barracks or hospitals or, in this case, into headquarters for the general. So that is why these loyalist houses are also proudly patriot houses, <laughs> uh, because they were used in the war. John, I think at some point you were saying that, uh, that the, from the various states, the opposition to the um, British troops and, and the British uh, power there, um, that, that it shifted, that they were convinced that they would back the Massachusetts effort. Did you say that something like that? Um, let's see, yes. Uh, immediately after April 1775, immediately after the Battle of Lexington and Concord, all of New England sent troops to uh, fight against the British Army inside Boston. The question was, would the other states uh, south of Connecticut join in? And if so, how? Would they express grave concern in letters to London? <laughs> or would they raise troops and uh, put their money behind the cause? And that's what the New England delegates were pushing for, and that's what they really got in June 1775 as the Continental Congress decided to uh, adopt the army, the New England army outside Boston and make General Washington a commander in chief and take some other steps. So before then, there had been some reluctance on those, the parts of those distant colonies saying, well, you know, this fight isn't really our fight. It's not like we have a fight that we destroyed all that tea. It's not like our government is being changed. And besides, those people up in New England are religious zealots anyway. <laughs> uh, that, there was some worry that that would be what happened. And in, in some ways, the First Continental Congress, the main business of the First Continental Congress was for the New England delegates to convince the politicians of the other colonies. We are not fire-breathing monsters. We are not zealots. Uh, we are united in a common cause, and we can work together. Yeah. There was an interesting portrait of a young Washington on a book cover. Was that a contemporaneous uh, um, picture? Let's see. Uh, do you recall which, uh, it, well, on a book cover it would have been The Invention of George Washington, it was just his face. That, no, that is a, I think that's a Charles Wilson Peale portrait from during the war. Um, and he, it just looked a little smooth. The, the earliest portrait of Washington that, that we have is the one that I showed at the beginning with the red uniform, uh, the, the red Virginia uniform. Um, what are, Charles Wilson Peale did many portraits of Washington over those, uh, over the 1770s and later. Um, I don't think, uh, unfortunately, Charles Wilson Peale does not stack up to me, for me, like John Singleton Copley, in actually capturing different physiognomies. I think all of Charles Wilson Peale's portraits look like the same person. <laughs> and so I'm not really sure how, how uh, accurate that picture of Washington was. In the back, yeah. Um, yes, when you mentioned that um, Washington invited Adams over for potluck, is that the same way we think of potluck? Yeah, I think he was saying basically, uh, come for dinner, don't expect one. Um, I think that if we look at what was happening, uh, at the descriptions of dinner, uh, here they seem to have had uh, this household of mostly military men. They had uh, General Gates' wife and General Washington's wife uh, and General Washington's stepdaughter eventually, but uh, it was really a male and youngish. Uh, um, uh, household. So, the, and there were also women on the serving staff, but I don't think they were being very formal. I think they had a lot of work to do. They used the room that we, uh, that was probably the dining room for meetings as well. So I think that they were, they were not, uh, they, he was trying to say, you don't expect anything fancy. What would the day be expected to bring? I don't. Oh, I don't think. No, I don't think Adams would expect to bring anything. And I don't think Washington brought anything. I think he went to the. Uh, he, he went to the, the, the household servants and said, you know, get, you know, it's time for dinner. But he, but by using the word potluck, he was he was signaling to Adams, you know, expect expect something military, expect something. Uh, whereas for formal dinners. Everyone went down the street to Thomas Mifflin, 
who was this <coughs> gentleman from Philadelphia. He had his wife there. There were other, there was a more uh, um, female household. Uh, he was in charge of supplies, so he had the best food. Um, and so when we hear about uh, Abigail Adams coming to meet Mary Morgan, when we hear about the native chief, when we hear about other formal dinners, they're often at Major Mifflin's house and not here. So, when uh, Adams gets elected vice president, he starts off in, in the cabinet, and the next thing he knows, Washington has him just known, oh, you're not part of the cabinet, you're, and, and Adams is, has choice words about the vice presidency to say at that point. So, if they were as close as you described them here, how does... Um, Adams, uh, Washington indeed didn't include Adams in his formal cabinet meetings uh, with these, the secretaries, but he did often have uh, meals with Adams, and he consulted private. And so I think that's, that was where the partnership worked. Mm -hmm. Adams was indeed, um, he, he, he found himself sort of not given formal duties by the executive branch, by Washington. He also was, uh, the, the vice presidency was seen as, as being in charge uh, of the Senate, of being the president of the Senate, like uh, Hancock was uh, chairman of the Continental Congress, though, except that the senators pretty quickly realized they had no, uh, they, didn't, they hadn't cho chosen him, they didn't uh, owe him anything. So he was, uh, didn't get to do that job either. And yes, Adams was the first of a long line of vice presidents who realized that the job was useless. <laughs> um, and you know, that did that did great on him. Um, but I think that he uh, he actually was a little more uh, satisfied with Washington with his personal relationships with Washington than with the system as a whole, or at least that's how he saw it. And of course, he did. Uh, Succeed Washington as uh, as president, uh, and um, uh, interesting. There were different styles about how they went about things, um, uh, but he certainly recognized uh, Washington as a very admirable man for uh, the rest of his life. Yeah. So back to portraits. <coughs> portraits, yes. Many portraits of Washington show him with his hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So was that? A style, or a style for him, or a trademark. Or oh yeah, and then we, we also see Napoleon that right. way. Yeah. That was just the fashion exactly. of how a gentleman was supposed to. I mean, you're, as a, I, I, I'm not exactly sure why, um, because I mean, there's so many things about 18th century style, like why the wig? Why do you spend your time as a gentleman having your head shaved and then putting on somebody else's hair? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Washington at least cut out the middleman by having his hair powdered instead. Um, why? I think possibly because gentlemen are not supposed to be emotional and they're not supposed to be under control, so you don't wave around your hands. You wave your hand. Uh, <laughs> think that's all I can think of is why they do that. <laughs> but yes, you can see that in a lot of Washington's portraits from this time. It didn't matter which hand, or was it always the same hand? Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've, not, I've not looked at that. Here he's, he's clearly hiding his, he's putting his left hand in. Maybe that keeps the right hand out. I don't know. <laughs> the layering in the buttons would only admit you know, one at one hand or the other would be very awkward. That's right, he was itchy. <laughs> well, you, well, yes, although, if mean, you notice, you're wearing, you wear your coat open and your waistcoat. Uh, clothes and, uh, it's, <laughs> and he's also another sartorial uh, detail. He, you can see these are portraits from 1776. He's wearing uh, what he, a, a sash or what he called a riband, uh, which um, he, in fact, one of the things he found when he came up to Massachusetts was he didn't think there was enough distinction between the different officers and between the officers and the men, between different levels of officers and between different levels of generals. So he had he bought this ribbon while living in this house to uh, distinguish himself, <laughs> and he had other ribbons for lower generals, and then there were cockades and hats for other officers. And this uh, actual piece of cloth was found in the Harvard archives uh, a few years ago, and is now on display at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. Very cool. 
Okay. Any other any other questions, comments? Uh, I yes. Just say your voice has completely made this presentation. Oh. Okay. <laughs> 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 really five presenters. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all.